blessed by a great message in the morning. And so, make it a point. Start your Sunday out right. Chapel service, 745 Suite 205, the Jake Suite. In the control tower. Dragsters, Dragsters, lanes one and two for Mickey Thompson around six. Dragsters, lanes one and two for Mickey Thompson around number six. We need you, please. So here we go, into our door cars. Peeps Pennington, David Graham gonna kick us off. Mickey Thompson, round number six. Door cars. David Graham, 631 right side. Peeps Pennington, 508 right side. Here on Fuel Tech Saturday. Still looking to crown a $30,000 winner. They're both away, five to a 28. When light goes, Peeps Pennington, 005, one above five, 20 total. David Graham, 28, dead nine, no good. Dylan Biondo, Caroline McCarty, Dylan turns it two thou red. Caroline is 14, goes 15 thou under. Dylan dead seven after the red light start. Dominic Lasalento, 663 left side. Colin Watson, Newark, Ohio, 79 Malibu right side, 654. Here we go. Los Hunto getting 900. Oh boy, Colin, that's the one you needed, bud. 
Dominic turns it three foul red and Colin Watson is human. Colin let go 50, but Dominic lights it up red. Mike Barber, Chris Bear. So Chris Baird on a 587, Mike Barber on a 610, 2300 head start goes to Mike Barber. Two to a 21, advantage Barber, win light Barber. Two take nine, one above six, 18 total. Chris Baird, 21, dead six, no good. All right, we are back in the tower here at Galat. I'm uh, joined by Will Holloman. It's, uh, we brought him up here, we just want to say hi. It's like, you know, everybody wants to get interviewed, we thought we didn't want to leave you out, right? No, it's not what we brought you up here for. It's, uh, we've uh, been, a, been a great few days of racing. It's been packed around some, some weather and, and these things. And uh, we have our, our Todd's Extreme Paint MVP award. And so for the last few days, we've been looking at, at Blaine Parrish and Robert Holden and, and Will. And uh, today it kind of separated a little bit for us. We're saying, man, Robert Holton and Will, we're both going deep. They're still going rounds. They're doing their thing. And uh, and so then Robert goes out and we, we start looking. We start digging deeper. And then we look at the uh, the winnings. And, and Will, you uh, had a pretty good week. You've uh, turned on a lot of wind lights this week. Uh, you turned on, I think we said, 24 wind lights in three days. Robert had turned on 18 wind lights in two days. Um, and so it was tough, but then you go deeper than that. And man, they didn't make it very easy on you this week. You, uh, you had a lot of double O lights, you had a lot of close finishes. So when it all came down to it and we, we award the MVP award, we say not only you know, who wins the most rounds, that's important obviously, but it's what you're doing beyond that. When you're turning wind lights on or you're not turning wind lights on, you're involved in a lot of good races. That's what, that's what separates the the, the great drivers from the really good drivers. So there's, there's, no, there's no bad drivers here. So um, I'm up here and I want to present the Todd's Extreme Paint. It'll be $1,000 and a custom painted helmet from Todd's Extreme Paint. And we're going to award the uh, MVP award to, uh, to Mr. Will Holloman. Congratulations. And I'm going to, uh, so Will, I kind of summed up a little bit, but it, it's your turn, bud. We're going to turn it over to you. Just kind of, I'll hold the check or something. You can hold the mic and uh, just kind of let us break down your week for us. Let us know what your experience has been here at Galop. Um, just a typical week, uh, 
found double O early. I think my two time runs I was one and four and just one of those deals. I didn't touch it from there. I let it ride all week. Uh, every time I, I don't get to race here much, even though I live close, but when I do come race here, they, uh, they don't welcome me back real well. I mean, they, they beat me pretty good. Uh, even when I make good runs, so bringing the fling in brings in another tier of racers. So I, uh, just stayed set up absolutely nothing and tried to take as little as possible. But it's cool because my teammate Chris Bear won MVP at uh, Columbus at the Summer Fling last year, so it's pretty cool to do it myself. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, you described it well, and, you, and that's not the only successes you had. You you won the warm-up race. You, you found yourself running off for the Rodex Heads. You had a lot of good things happen for you this week, and it's uh, it's been fun to watch. It made it exciting. It's you know, it seems like you have one person that kind of runs away with it during the course of a week, and this week it made it made it very interesting. But at the end of the day, Will, you uh, you earned it. You deserve it. And uh, we're proud to present to you the Todd's Extreme Paint MVP Award for the Strange Spring Fling here at Galat, presented by Optima Battery. So congratulations, Will. Thanks so much for racing with us, and uh, continue success down the road. Yep. Thank you. What do you think of the color scheme on that there, Helen? Carolina blue, just like God <laughs> intended. <laughs>
much are going on. Safety equipment going on. And we're about to go down the racetrack. I believe we got 11 total left. Stay tuned for an important announcement from Lola Pelvalos. Jamie Holt, no, announced that already. Let's see, um, roll down, roll down. She's like, read your text messages. Oh, Corey Galetti. Is that the one? That's what you're talking about? Corey Galetti had the best losing package of round number five. You're going to win a certificate to Hoosier Racing, for Hoosier Racing Slicks, so thanks to Hoosier Racing Tire. Round five sponsor, Corey Galetti, best losing package of Hoosier. Round number five, you'll get a certificate for a set of slicks. Congratulations, Corey Galetti. So here we go. Garrett Griffith, 631 left side. Peeps Pennington, 509 right side. So here we go. Pennington. Give it up 1.22 seconds to G-Man in the S10. 631, 509. Winner comes back to the quarterfinals. Oh boy, Garrett's 21 and 21 foul behind. Win live peeps. Trip, zip, take 30, goes one above three, 13 total. Garrett locked out, 21 and two above, no good. Jeremy York, Tim Markaglu, 6th out, separate him. Here comes Markaglu. Win lie says Jeremy York. 17, take 6, goes 23 total. That's Markaglu. 11, 1 above 8 to be 29 total. No good. York to the quarterfinals for 30 grand. G. Pascal, 458 left side. Brian Self, Atoka, Oklahoma, 428 in the right side. Self turns it 2 foul red. TG Pascal 12, one above zero, 22 total. Self was 16 foul over after the red light start. Yesterday was the day of the truck. Today's the day of the dragsters. Kyle Coltrera, 450 left side. Chris Stein, Silver Lake, Indiana. OEM Combustion Services. Stein Tire, Schaefer Oil. Several others on the side of that thing that I couldn't remember. 414, the dial for Stein.
Kyle Stein turns it three foul red. Kyle Coltrera, double or three green. Stein dead nine after the red light start. Coltrera takes his foot out, goes two tenths above. Cameron Fredrickson, Riverview, Florida, 442 left side. Todd Piper, St. George, Kansas, 462 in the right side. So Todd Piper getting two tenths head start from Cameron Fredrickson. Thirteen to a twenty-seven advantage. Todd Piper, win light Piper. Thirteen take five. One above zero. Twenty-three total. Cameron Fredrickson locked out. Twenty-seven dead one. Donovan Williams on the solo, 17 up front. Goes 469 at 146. So yeah, I misspoke. I got around ahead of myself trying to count them down and count them down. So we'll have 11 next round, I believe. So let's talk reaction times. A lot of times people will ask me, what do you set up for? You got some guys that just say, I set up for a nine or 10, um, no matter what. I have a little bit different philosophy. I, depending on the round, so for instance, first round, and I battle this with Marco Perovolaris all the time. First, he sets up super aggressive and I always preach aggression, first of all. I think everyone could use to be a little more aggressive and a little less afraid of the red light. Secondly, first round, you only have one one or two laps under your belt. You, you, you can't set up 005 because you don't know, you, you really don't know your window yet. Um, and also your opponent only had one or two runs. So the chances they're gonna be low double O is, is also uh, not a good chance. So first round, I tend to pad the box a little bit and because I don't have much data to go by. So, let, so let's just say if I'm 005 and 009 on my time runs, I'm definitely not gonna take any out. I'll probably add two or three thousandths in to cover that. Um, now, when you get into later rounds, it's a different story. You start gathering data, you start getting more confident, uh, you start seeing what your window is. And at, on those, so basically first round, I'm more like a 10-12 setup guy. Later rounds, I'm not afraid to set up 005. And, it, and, it, and if I'm really killing it, I'm not even afraid to set up 003 or 004 in certain situations. Now, light conditions. How do light conditions play into all of this? The best I could explain is, from my experience, the quickest part of the day is gonna be dusk or morning before the sun 
really comes up. It gets high in the sky. The slowest part of the day is, is going to be when it's really bright and sunny and dark. So, but with incandescent bulbs back in the day, you'd have to move maybe 15 thou, 200 sometimes, depending, especially depending on the sun. With, with the LED bulbs, you really shouldn't be overthinking that. You don't have to do much to the box because day to night, sun to no sun, it's pretty consistent. The only thing I'd say is what I see nighttime, if anything, people need to be more aggressive. Um, they seem to slow up a little bit at night and that's somewhat dependent on the light conditions at the race they're at. Direct Fit dash panels take the time and guesswork out of installing a new dash in your vehicle. With hundreds of makes and models available, including over 50 new models this year, Direct Fit dash panels easily replace worn, faded, or outdated dashes while maintaining a factory-like appearance. Autometer Direct Fit dash panels are made in the USA from a durable, thermoformed, UV-protected ABS material. Panels are available in two, five and six gauge configurations that require no cutting, drilling or modification to the original dash. Simplify your dash replacement and avoid custom fabrication with a direct fit dash panel from Autometer. You have different skill sets, different skill levels on where they're at. Uh, the goal on, on, on this, and I'll stay on here as long as you, got, you guys want, um, is to give you guys, no matter what skill set you're at, a foundation, just a couple of foundational points to build a foundation for you as a racer, regardless of what skill set you're at. And one foundation point, I'll call it, is, is keeping a very simple game plan. Uh, the simply like a game, like Mike, it sounds like you don't hold too much. Maybe your game plan is, all right, I know I can cover my number. I'm probably right. going one under, let's just say. And, yep. and I, I can relate to this because early in early 2000s at ACO, I ran a weekend like this and it was real simple. I said to myself, if I can get to the stripe first, I'm going to get there by as little as I can. Because if I'm not going to get, if, if I see he's getting there, I'm just, I'm just going to bail out a hundredth, hundredth and a half. I wasn't holding much. I was killing a tree and, and I, I, I did great. And, but even with all the tools I have in my, my toolbox weapon, so to speak, that was the simple game plan I chose to use uh, for that day, for that weekend. And I think if you can just simplify it more, and it, it sounds like you're, you're, you're kind of getting ahead of yourself as you're going down a track and, mm -hmm. And and you're overcomplicating, and and it turn into second guessing. Just keep it really, really simple. Okay. Sprinkling event, it's one of the most prestigious events you can win because a lot of really good bracket racers show up and it's just a really tough atmosphere. These are some of the best bracket racers all over the U.S. There's a great turnout this year and I'm going up against the best of the best trying to put my best foot forward. I think it's it's been really awesome. Definitely being challenged out here. If someone asked me about sprinkling, I would tell them to come and enjoy it because it's a great time. It's a full week of racing and, and a lot of beautiful cars and a lot of good competition. If I was asked by anyone whether or not they should come to the Spring Fling, I would say absolutely. It's the best race on the West Coast. I would absolutely recommend it. Go Spring Fling team. Racers serving up the very best parts.
That's what Mazir Enterprises is all about. Since our first product introduction in the 1980s, we have been in the relentless pursuit of excellence on the track and off with a mission to produce the very best parts. Problem solving parts for your high performance vehicle. No matter if it's chassis and fabrication, water pump and cooling system, starters and the accompanying electrical or full billet flex plates you're after, look to Mazir for the best solutions. I mean, when you're going for $100,000 winner take all and a $7,500 fuel factory team bonus, there's going to be some tension out there. We have some multi-time NHRA world champions. We have some million dollar race winners, some young guns. It's going to be a bloodbath. That is a really talented group we've got up there. And a big tip of the cap for the folks at Fuel Factory getting involved. Somebody standing in this picture is going to go home with $100,000 that they didn't have when they woke up this morning. And we are racing for real. Zip taking less than a thousand. Right place, right time. Three aces of handicap, 1.11 seconds. Richardson in a blue car will be off and running. Taylor in the roadster on the chase. Richardson, 023, one above. Beats 025, two above. Five thousandths of a second at the stripe, plus one eight. Taylor's plus two one. Scotty Richardson, congratulations, picking up the big bucks. I'm really speechless because I come here and I wanted to run this race just because these young guys ain't as good as what they think. And, and us old guys still got a little gas. Really, I don't know what else to say other than thank you for everybody that's been part of it. It's been a fun day. Thank you for everybody who shared the mic.
Some people have an unextinguishable fire to compete, a fire that burns and ignites. The same fire inspires us. It pushes us to run an engine to the edge for just a few more horsepower. Fuel Factory is performance driven, built by racers for racers. We are focused on racing fuel, plain and simple. We want to go fast, we want to win, and we want the same for you. We are Fuel Factory, built for speed. Well, this way, you know, it, it's the old story. You do well, you win a couple of races, and then right away, everybody's against you, everybody's your enemy. You know, it, it's not fair, but that's the way it is. Watch carefully, these stock eliminator finals are always so close. And how about this? Sal Biondo takes the win. It's the 100th final for the Biondo family, and it's a winning one for Sal. Sal Biondo, Peter Biondo, many, many, many national event wins. Of course, brother Peter has won any number of sportsman championships. For the third time in the last 12 years, here at Maple Grove, Peter Biondo, Sal Biondo, both win their respective eliminators at the same national event. Biondo Racing Products, a family-owned and operated business, now in the 35th year of racers, providing racers with over 50 years of racing experience and expertise. Please check us out at BiondoRacing.com. Making a quick lap out there with the tractor and we'll be ready to go. Eleven left. We bring back six. They'll be on a ladder based on reaction time.
And a quick down and back, a little broom and drag, clean up, put a little heat in the racetrack, and we're ready. Fire the first pair. Tom Articus in the truck, fresh off of his pro win. And Carolyn McCarty in a Rambler wagon. Six door cars, five dragsters, that'll return six and that'll put us on a ladder. Articus is on a 643. Carolyn's on a 598. Head start goes to the truck. Locked into the staging beams now. We're ready. Both drivers away on the green. B15 or be in trouble. Articus was 15, but he got himself too big a bite down there. He got dropped. 6.42, 5 is 5,000 too quick. Carolyn was 040 and got away with it. Fed Tom the stripe, drops back to dead three at 111 miles an hour, and Carolyn McCarty is going to advance the Rambler to the next round. Preston, a.k.a. Peeps Pennington in the left side, and Colin Watson. Peets, Peeps has still got two entries in. So no matter what happens here, he'll be hustling back around to race again. The potential of carrying two into the final six Carries with it some very interesting possibilities since they're going to be on a ladder based on reaction time. It could have a chance for Peeps to run himself in the final. It could have a chance for Peeps to run himself for the bye to the final. Or it could have none of the above. 011, reaction time. 509 on the 508, Pennington. That's going to be a winner. Watson goes 50 on a 48. Not enough. Colin was 006. Had a reaction time by five thousandths of a second. But Pennington slides by by a hundo down at the other end. And he takes one into the quarterfinals. And he'll come back and see if he can get another one into the quarterfinals. And while he does that, We'll roll in some dragsters. Donovan Williams, team overkill out of Florida, Todd Piper, team Kansas. Piper's on a 463, Williams on a 475.
Not a lot of head start, but what little there is is going to go to the left lane. And then you've got less than five seconds to make a decision. Take, give, drop, park, womp. Or just close your eyes and pray. That's the one thing that I didn't ever like about eighth mile racing is it took me longer to make a wrong decision. I usually needed at least eight or nine seconds to screw it up. And if I only had five, it just didn't work. Both drivers away on the green. Williams had the bulb. Piper gets the wind light. 26 dead one. That's Todd Piper's number. Donovan Williams was 019. Got there first. Ran 9th out too quick. And he had some room. Got there by 17. Got there too quick by nine of it. So Todd Piper joins Pennington in the quarters by winning with the worst light. We have not seen a whole lot of that, especially later on this afternoon. T.G. Paschal, Jeremy York. They turn loose green. Jeremy, 002, dead six. Put together eight foul. TG was 10, taking one ten thousandth of a second, but Jeremy was eight. Whatever TG did after 10 wasn't going to make any difference. He got there first, going under by two, 58-8, on to 59. So York becomes the first of our three pairs to actually have the better light and win the round. And we should have one more dragster back there. And as soon as Pennington gets back, we'll have a pair of door cars. Then we'll be down to six. Figure out how they're gonna hack it up. And then race for the big share. Mike Eames brought it up to Peter and I and said, you know, we give away these coins at our racetrack that we used to, you know, run, and they're a really cool token that people seem to love. So uh, he said, can you think of anything like how to give one away? Um, so Peter and I just started brainstorming, and, you know, we liked the idea of it being um, something that had, had to do with a perfect light, you know, like the perfect coin. So we went back and forth with all these names, and me and Lella and Peter sat down, and we had, we were like three-way chatting, and... We put down like a couple names and stuff and we were like shooting them back and forth to each other and we finally settled on triple zero hero coin and we're calling it the KS triple zero hero coin. So any racer who is triple zero with a wind light, they receive a coin um, and I don't know which is better, the coin or the $50 that goes with it, but people seem to really like the coin and in fact some don't even come and collect their $50 and uh, they just are really, really, the coin is really special and it's really cool. So I have one here. We ended up putting Kyle's face on the front of it, um, which is really neat. We worked with this great company that uh, really kind of did a, a really great job memorializing his face in this coin. And then the back um, says perfect triple zero winner at the flings. Uh, and then the bottom says let's roll because that was Kyle's tagline. And anyone who is lucky enough to know Kyle knows that he's just all about good times, let's roll. Kyle, Kyle breaking in tires for the Pro Stock team while he's out here this weekend. Or maybe he just decided he's doing that because burnouts are fun. So the best.
last light so far is a 002. One of the winning lights was a 26. The other one was 12, is that right? I think so. They're just picking a spot on the ladder. Well, he shut it off early down there after a double O eight reaction time. We have five names penciled in to the quarterfinals. And we'll figure out if the sixth name is going to be a new one or if it's going to be peeps. Oh, you know. Let's do it. So it's, it's a really cool coin that just adds a little fun to the event. All right, here we are, Las Vegas Motor Speedway, the Moser Spring Fling Million. It's first round, we're at the ET Shack, and here's another edition of Terminator Tips. So a common theme, a common situation that I see and have people ask me is, why do these guys hold so much? Why do, there's a certain, mostly the traveling pros they call them, that will hold four to five numbers, two to three numbers. And why do they do that? Well, some would say it's so they can drive the finish line, but one of the main reasons they do it is to show you, if you're in the other lane, a totally different look. They usually, it's getting close down there. When you race one of them, they have you covered up early. So guess what? They want you to say, oh shit, I'm, I'm, I'm screwed and get you in a negative mindset and maybe a knee jerk reaction and they'll try to take you out of your game and dump early and uh, and that's how they get more room down there. They, they're getting you to do something that you weren't strategizing to do. So you end up going, let's say three off the dial. So my main um, point here is when these guys have you covered up, it, keep your mental game strong and just execute like you were going to. If you're not holding, you don't need to do much. If you're holding to spot drop, you spot drop, but don't do anything different just because they're showing you a different look. All right, racers, I'm hanging out here with Bubba Browning. Bubba, I'd like to present to you our Todd Barton Designs Best Appearing Car Award out here today at the Spring Fling. Uh, tell me a little bit, Bubba, about this beautiful hot rod behind us. Uh, I got this car off my cousin, Troy Williams Jr. Um, back in October, um, decided to do some upgrades. Um, my buddy, John Siegel, um, helped me out a lot. He, we kind of took it, he took it under his wing and um, kind of steered me in the right direction. It's been four or five months of just nothing but love and um, didn't clip any corners. Um, I think he did a pretty nice job, if I'd say so myself. Did a lot of hard work in this thing. So you spent about four or five months. Uh, what was the condition before you put that much time in it? What was it, what, what was the starting point? I mean, it, it was, it, it was in okay condition. It just, um, you know, it's, it's 1967 Chevy two and um, probably hasn't had a whole lot done to it since it was brand new. It used to be, it used to be the old Harold Stout car. Um, and we just went through and just basically cleaned it up a little bit. Um, you know, did some chassis stuff. We got underneath, ran into some stuff. Um, change, actually changed a bunch. Um, I, I think, you know, it turned out really well. We definitely didn't cut no corners. This pearl white paint job on here just absolutely pops in the sunshine. Uh, did you guys do the paint? Yeah, um, this is a John Siegel one-off. Um, this is actually a Cadillac paint color with a little bit more metallic. 
Uh, we were sitting around trying to figure out what we were going to paint it. And uh, we went originally with white. And then um, through the process, we added the black top. And uh, he kicked some more metallic on the black top as well. So, um, yeah, we're pretty impressed with the way it turned out. You know, you, you go into something with a vision and, and you're not quite sure how it turns out. When it rolled out of the paint booth, we were pretty excited. Inside and out, a beautiful hot rod. Tell me just a little bit about the power plant. Um, it's got, actually, it's got John Spare motor right now. We got the original motor. We wanted to make Galat, so um, we got the other motor um, being finished. Um, that's going to be a 434. This is actually a 408. Um, it's John Spare to the wagon, so that's hence the color that it is. But the original motor is all white to match the car. Thank Peter and uh, Spring Fling. Um, this is my first one actually, and I'm very impressed. You know, with all the, the weather conditions that we fought, um, the track staff and everybody getting this thing in. It's uh, just as a racer, it's very uh, much appreciated. If you're out here on the property at Galat, come and check out Bubba's car. This thing is absolutely killer. Congratulations on your Todd Barton Designs Best Appearing Car Award. And of course, as you know, $500 bonus comes along with awesome. that. That's awesome. And uh, thank you so much for supporting the Strange Spring Fling presented by Optima Batteries out here at Galat. Hello racers, we have a treat for you today. I have some really smart guys on here, both from the technical side and also from the racer side that we're gonna talk about the age old controversy of alcohol versus gas. So we're gonna start with Mark Wessler from Fuel Factory. He's a director of sales. Um, then we're gonna transition into Luke Wagaki and we're gonna give you the positives, negatives, and our general thoughts of alcohol versus gas. So uh, Mark, first tell us a little bit about Fuel Factory. You're new in the business, you're starting to make a pretty wide footprint, it seems. And what's uh, when did you enter the market and what are you guys all about? I know, and this guy, by the way, for everyone who's watching, has more experience in, in racing fuel than probably anybody that I know personally. Sure, thanks. Thanks, Pete. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here and, and have the conversation. And uh, So Fuel Factory, we launched at the 2022 version of the PRI show. We had spent about 12 to 14 months prior to that uh, putting together our, our blends and our proprietary formulations, working with engine builders, doing a bunch of on-track testing uh, at many of the big bracket races that uh, either you put on or uh, that many of your uh, customers attend before the brand even actually went public. Luke, you've run gas on um, on all your, your super class stuff. Super, You won a world championship in super gas. You run super comp. And you've also put a, uh, brought out a new little cool Vega recently in the last couple of years, and that's printing tickets on alcohol. Um, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts. If a racer came to you, Luke, and said, I'm, 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 building, a, uh, I'm building a race car. That's all he tells you. I'm Pennington left, Barber right. If Peeps wins, depending on what his reaction time is, he potentially could have to run himself in the next round. If Mike Barber wins, well, that goes out the window. But if Mike Barber wins, he potentially could have to run Pennington again next round. Depending on reaction time, because that's what sets the ladder. Right now, neither one of these drivers is thinking about the next round. They're just thinking about getting to the next round.
Pennington's ready. Barber's ready. Mustang goes. Peeps goes. Down to the stripe. Pennington, 006, take 007. And he's going to get the win. Barber goes 6085 on a 610. That's under by 15 thou. Pennington, under 6 thou. And Pennington goes to the final six. And Peeps does not run himself, at least this round. Building a race car, should I put it on alcohol or for, for these big buck bracket races? Should I put it on alcohol or gas? So I think Mark hit it on the head in terms of you can make an argument for each, especially given your specific application. Um, as you mentioned, like a lot of today's um, higher horsepower, newer technology power plants, like your spread port stuff, or even for the most part, your 20 degree stuff, like it's just happier on gas. It's easier to make gas work, right? And not to say that you can't make alcohol work on something like that, but more prevalent on gas. Versus, you know, something like you mentioned my Vega, that's just a, a 383 with a decent set of aluminum heads, like kind of your bare bones combination, like for something like that, I would much more make an argument for alcohol. Um, now for everything in between that you could kind of go either way, I think the easiest way to sum it up from a, from a bracket racing standpoint, like I came from the school, you know, 20, 30 years ago, everybody said, Hey, you run alcohol because it's more consistent. And I still think that that statement is accurate today. Like I think the right alcohol setup is more quote unquote consistent in that when it's right, something like my Vega, it should go 629 at noon when I roll in and it should go 629 at midnight in the final and nothing in between. And that's very easy to keep up with, right? Like it doesn't, in most cases, it doesn't really even matter what the weather's doing. Like it should just stay there. I would make the counter argument that <clears throat> on a similar combination, gas, while it may not be as quote unquote un, uh, consistent, it is every bit and at times even more predictable in terms of it's not going to run 629 all day long, but it's going to follow the weather and you're going to know exactly what's coming. And the, the advantage to gas, I think, which is probably more prevalent today than ever, you talked about the the NHRA racing and superclass racing that we do where races are, are often day to day, right? And you go into have a, a, a round or two throughout the event in which you haven't made a time trial that day. Well, that, as you know, Pete, is becoming more and more common in the big dollar bracket scene. And when you've got significant changes in weather from one run to the next or one day to the next, I would actually argue that from, in my experience, gas is actually more predictable in knowing what's coming. So it's alcohol is consistent, gas is predictable. There's a happy medium there somewhere, depending on what you want to do. My take on it is this. It's the alcohol is so much more forgiving that it's a little bit more, it's a lot more, it is a wider range where your, your tune-up's going to work really well in a wider range. Um, wider, ra wider range of weather. Um, gasoline, can be, and, and I am Fletcher's a big gas guy, um, and he helped me with my car. Gasoline could be as good and more, uh, not quite as consistent, but very consistent and predictable for like what Luke said, those first runs of the morning at a big buck bracket race when you have a big weather change. And some of the guys on alcohol, I know when I used to run and I ran Indy on alcohol, the next day, I know Luke goes through this uh, at, a, at a big buck bracket race, but the next day, it, weather changes so much. Okay, am I gonna am I gonna pick up three hundreds or am I gonna pick up five hundreds? Where on gas, I know I'm gonna pick up eight to nine hundreds. What you're saying, uh, I know that sounds like a lot, but it's it really maps out and it's predictable. Um, my take on the gas though is it does have its advantages, but you you have to you have to stay on top of the tune up. You have to. So to get my car good at New Media on gas, um, I ended up having to change a lot of things. I ended up having to lean it out, run a more oxygenated fuel, 
And um, where if I was on alcohol, I probably wouldn't have had to go through that little struggle, that that hump that I kind of looked like a fool the first first three days I was at New Media this summer. Um, now, I will say this. On gas, I think most people are running too rich. I think they get the carburetor from their motor guys who are a little bit more uh, conservative and want to make sure there's enough fuel going to it. And then they go to eighth mile and then they go to summertime. Um, I really think that a lot of gas guys probably could use to lean it out, but and stick with that. Interrupt, bra bracket right. racing 101, your converter should be looser and you could lean it down some. We fixed it. Let's switch over to gas since that's what you're very experienced in, Mark. Uh, let's give the audience, the racers, a summary of some different fuels that could be popular in, bra that are popular in bracket racing that you offer um, from a small block Chevy to a you know, uh, something with more compression versus something with less compression versus uh, a 12 degree 632. Sure. And again, I think it just depends on uh, what it is you're trying to accomplish with, with your particular application. But, you know, we've got your what we consider conventional fuels in your, your what we call F12, F14, and F16 um, could be used in everything from a from a high RPM small block to a, you know, a 17 or 18 and a half to one, um, you know, SR20 headed, you know, 632. Uh, continues to be more and more popular are the oxygenated fuels. And guys feel like they do act and uh, a little bit more uh, consistent and weather swings and maybe act a little bit more like methanol. So we've got a couple of different oxygenated fuels that uh, quite a few bracket racers are out there running now. But uh, yeah, we've got the whole lineup. So um, fuelfactoryusa.com is the website. And we'll be on hand at uh, the next two fling events here to answer any questions and help take care of uh, fuel needs. Well, great advice from two really smart people in the industry. I appreciate you both coming on and uh, sharing your experience, sharing your advice with the racing community.
Welcome to Behind the Flings. Today we're with Matt Costable. Matt won the one of the 50K races at Spring Fling a lot. Matt, how's it going today? Good, buddy. How are you? Doing good, man. Um, Matt, tell tell the audience, tell the racers a little bit about where you're from and how you got started in drag racing. Uh, I'm from Port Dover, Ontario, Canada. Uh, I got started driving at 16, but my dad took me to the local drag strip here when I was seven years old. Um, it was a pro mod race on Labor Day weekend. Um, Johnny Rocca had his pro mod here and it was the old pro mod deals where they had the clutch car, uh, blew up on the start line. <laughs> so he needed to get to the next round, went back to the trailer. I watched him pull the motor out, put the spare motor and won the event. Ever since then, I've been hooked. That's pretty cool. So since seven years old. Yep. Yep. And how long have you been racing the car that you won the, uh, the spring fling go out in? This one I bought in 2017. Yeah. That's ironic because the guy who won the Spring Fling Million, Andy Schmoll, um, he, he started racing his Beretta in 2017. Interesting. So that, that's uh, that's pretty cool. Ironic. Good uh, year. So what, what, for, there's a couple of things that stood out to me at the event. Um, number one, I didn't realize you were from Canada. Um, so kudos to you for – it definitely was our second to worst forecast we ever had out of like 20 – something events or 30 events I can't even remember now as far as weather goes and you you had the um you had the fortitude and the courage to come down from to make that long trip from Canada so I want to thank you for that 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 means a lot yeah no problem man it was awesome yeah that's a that's a long trip to take when you're looking at those apps and it's showing rain rain uh half the time um, but thanks for that. But you, you, you know, you look like you were having a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of things that stood out to me. Um, one, you were, I'm not going to call, I'm a loner. All right. When I'm racing, I, I just like, I mean, my, it's me and my brain working. Um, you kind of came off like you were on your own, a little bit of a loner. And that's of the stage lanes. Everyone has their clicks over here. All the Southern guys. Um, you were just doing your thing, man. You didn't seem intimidated. Um, as the rounds went on, you didn't, you didn't seem, uh, like your, you didn't seem like your demeanor changed, uh, and it, even going into the final. So tell, tell the racers, uh, a little bit about what those, the rounds felt like, especially that you had to start on Wednesday and then we had some rain and finish on Thursday. That had to be a challenge in itself. Uh, so walk us through the event, anything that stands out, uh, for the race that you won, any rounds that stand out? And how did you keep that mental fortitude the whole way through? Um, well, let's go back to Wednesday. Um, it was round two. I was in the puddle when it started raining. So that kind of <clears throat> put a damper on things. And then, obviously, you made the call on Thursday, and it started raining again, and we're ready to go. And that was a little disappointing. I was sitting there thinking, like, why did I tow down here and just sit in rain? I could be at home. Um so I made a call. I don't, I don't blame you for thinking that. After after Thursday, when we called you to the lanes and started uh, drizzling again, I was I was just beside myself. But right. I understand from a racer point of view. Yeah. Right. So I got I was a little frustrated. Uh, I made a call home to the girlfriend, and she kind of talked me down a little bit and uh, said, "Hey, man, like you're down there, you're racing." Everybody here at home is sitting. They don't even have their stuff out of the garage yet, out of storage. So what's the worst that could happen? Um, so at that point I just kind of zoned in and I don't really know if there's a round that stood out, maybe fourth round. Um, that was kind of like the la the last event I was at uh, a year prior. I kind of got a little intimidated by the opponent in that round and I missed a tree. So when I had him again in round four, ironically, um, I was kind of, maybe this could be the day things are starting to jive a little bit. And then I don't know, after that, I just it's easy when you can trust the car, right? It's a uh, man and the and machine. That's right. So it just made my job a lot easier. And I was seeing good. As long as you see good and the car was working, I, that's the way the way she wrote, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, and, you know, you uh, mentioned fourth round. Now, everybody, including myself, is wondering who that opponent was. Oh, Verdi. Jeff Verdi. Oh, the million-dollar man. The million-dollar yeah, man. Yeah, he's a tough out. Yeah. yeah. He, he, um, 
he's very diligent. He puts up great runs. So how did that one yeah. go down? Uh, I had him on the tree uh, by two hun and went down there and sat down. Yeah. All right. So let's fast forward um, a little bit to the final round to or semis. That's when we were late in the race. That's when I really noticed. That's the, probably about the quarterfinals to the semis is when I really I was talking to Tim Fletcher who runs our staging lanes and and um, I'll just be flat out. The last couple of years have been a blur, and I was like. You know, everyone's asking me a towel who I think is going to win. What do you think of this guy? He goes, no, he's I know him. He's good. He goes, he's my pick. And there was some some big names left at quarterfinals. So uh, I what I noticed that, you know, it, it was just I'm not going to say it was a David versus Goliath story, but I didn't know. I didn't know who you were, but you didn't seem intimidated one bit. And when we when it came to the split um, in the final it was a pretty big disparity between winner and runner-up. There were some deals made, but it was a pretty big disparity between winner and runner-up. And Tim Thomas uh, was asking if he wanted to cut it down a little more evenly, and you said no. You said he would touch his race. Yeah, that's but right. Was, were you really confident, or what, what went behind yeah. that decision? Yeah, I was. I felt, I felt good. I felt that I – worst-case scenario, I'm going home with 16 and a half. Honestly, man, I came down to that race, obviously, with the forecast the way it was. Even if I do a couple burnouts and I make a couple passes and I go home with empty pockets, I don't care. I'm having fun, right? So at that point, I don't know. that I was happy at 16.5. I mean, some guys, they no split and it goes the other way and they don't get it, right? But at that point, I don't know. I was just confident in the car and confident in myself, and that's the decision that I made. Yeah, it, it definitely was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, and I've been in situations in the staging lanes, especially in the million dollar races, fling events on the West Coast that you didn't say no in a nasty way. You didn't, you know, th there's people that I, I noticed this, that they'll try to intimidate their opponents, like not even look at them. And you were friendly about it, but you were confident. It was, it, it just played right along with, what I saw leading up to it, you just seemed like a confident guy um, that was doing his own thing, man, and you didn't let anything bother you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What, what what can you tell, um, like the average local racer? Let's say a local racer at your your home track in in um, in Canada. What a lot of these local racers are intimidated, Matt. They're I'm not coming to, uh, and not just our big race, but any big race. They're, they're double O dead on. They're sharks. They're they're uh, they're traveling pros. What what would you tell them? Uh, what would you say to them? There's a lot of people that do say that around here, um, and I tell them you got to be there, man. You got to go to the race. I was there. I was at that point. Uh, the first time I went to a money race was at Martin, Michigan, in 2017. It was a different animal, definitely. Um, but it made me turn around and go home and, and come back and, uh, hone my craft a little more to up the game, step it up. Right. And still, instead of just keeping it as like, uh, oh, whatever happens. Um, but in speaking to that, you definitely have to be at the race. You can't sit here. Like I got the motor mini on right now watching it. You can't sit here and just, I wish, I wish, I wish you got to be there. Everybody's got a shot, right? Everybody's got a shot. And you just well, and especially this this day and age, eighth mile, dual cars are separate. Um, it, it's anybody's game. And you're seeing that more and more um, at our events, especially. I'm noticing more and more the, the widespread, the variety of winners. Um, it's it's really cool. It's it's a lot of uh, parity in the sport right now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it was fun to watch you win. Uh, tell us, the Camaro obviously was on point. Um, tell us a little bit about the car. Uh, it was built in 94 by a father and son, uh, Joe and Tom Benny. Unfortunately, Tommy's not with us anymore. Um, it was built in a barn. It's a kit car. It's a Art Morrison kit car. Um, it's won a bunch of local races around here. And then it came up for sale in uh, 2017. Went through a couple different owners. Um, and then it came up for sale in 2017. I bought it and nobody touched it for about, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Like, Every nut and bolt I needed to replace, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I fixed it all, went through the whole car. It's been a fight trying to find the right four-link setup for it and the right tire for it. Um, but last year I hit on it. 
I found the, the right combination. Just need a little fine tweaking. I did a little fine tweaking over the winter time, and now it uh, it works really good, man. It works really good for an old race car. Yeah, it's it looks it reminds me of like an old pro stock or in the eighties. Yeah. So. What um or or nineties? What uh what ET is it run? What what ET were you running down at? Uh five twenties. Five twenties, wow, that's yeah. that's definitely on the lower end of the door car. So you're pretty much setting everybody out um and, and chasing them down. You have any any strategy that or game plan that you your go to strategy or go to game plan when you're at these big money races? Like uh you want to trust a car more, you want to hold some numbers or is it just all situational it's mostly situational it depends on how i'm seeing the tree like i mean if you're not seeing the tree well then obviously you're going to put some in your pocket um but sometimes if you are seeing the tree well then it, now it comes down to the opponent because i know a lot of guys got stuff in their pocket right and they got three four eight nine sometimes a full tenth it all depends on the situation, um, but by rule of thumb is if I'm seeing good, then I'm holding less than what I would be if I'm letting go 22 every grip. You know what I mean? Right. No, that makes sense. If, you, if you're not hitting the tree well, you don't want to give your opponent a look at the other end where they have plenty of room. But again, you're at an advantage. You're running a lot against a lot of low six-second cars that probably have a hard time judging you and, and are a little bit intimidated to turn ahead. Because you're, what are you going, about 130 miles per hour in the eighth? 131, yep. Yep. Uh, alcohol or gas? Alcohol, yep. What, yep. what do you like about alcohol? Uh, the predictability throughout the day with weather changes, it doesn't vary as much. Um, like a C12 setup, my engine builder hates my alcohol, but um, oh, the so. C12, what's that? I, most engine builders do. Most do, yeah. But um, the predictability where it doesn't do the swing with the gas, it moves a lot of numbers. Like if you go from like Glot, we were 87 degrees during the day and then it dropped down to 60s when we we're still racing, right? So that swing there, number wise, I mean, it's predictable, but I like the alcohol because you don't have to think about it. You don't have to think about it. Well, you certainly had a handle on it with the, especially with the day-to-day -day and the changing weather conditions in, in Glot. Um, Matt, what would you tell? I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna put you a little bit on the spot here. Well, where he wins all the ties. Video on Facebook, you can see for yourself. Pennington in the left side is still in with two. Whether he turns on the scoreboard down there on the left side or not, he'll be back to race again tonight. He has the potential to race himself in the semis. He has the potential to race himself in the final, and he has the potential to go out here in the quarters in both. He's got so much potential. Todd Piper, out of Kansas over here on the right side. 463 is the number that Piper has chosen. Pennington says 509. He's made enough laps on that car today. He should be pretty comfortable by now. Both drivers away on the green. From the you got to be kidding me department, Todd Piper 001 takes 003. See you tomorrow. Pennington goes trip, zip, perfect, and wins it on the double breakout. Piper, under by seven. Pennington, under by three. Todd Piper, 001, taking 003 for the loss. Come on, man. Pennington is perfect, and that's the buy run to the final, unless somebody else is perfect and closer to their dial. Caroline McCarty in the Rambler. Jeremy York in the Dragster. Double O one, take double O three to go home. Carolyn's red four out. Jeremy York moves on. Jeremy's twelve at this side. Four forty six down the track. Carolyn runs dead eight. Being red. Double O four.
Dear every bracket racer on the planet, how would you like to be 001 taking 003 with big money on the line? Yes, please. Sorry about your luck. Unbelievable. As soon as, as soon as Peeps gets back, we'll figure out if he's going to take two or if Kyle Coltrera can get the win and return for the semifinals. What would you tell, it's a two-fold question. Um, if you had one piece of advice to give racers mentally on how you carry through that day and just one piece of mental advice as far as racing goes and then one piece of advice as far as like a car setup or or um, something to do with the car and ET, alcohol, whatever. Um, well, we'll go with the car first. Um, find something that works for you. Not what, what works on your car is not going to work on mine. Don't be afraid to try things. Um, I've had the four link set up in six different positions last year and nothing worked until you find the right one. Everything on paper will say that it works, but on the track is different. Um, and when it comes to something mentally, um, I'd like to stick to my four agreements. And actually <laughs> the, the four agreements that I stick to that I keep in, um, in my life on the racetrack, outside of the racetrack and in everyday life, is uh, that I'm always impeccable to my word. Don't take anything personal. Um, don't make assumptions. And always do your best, man. That's all you can do. I like that. You 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 have uh, four um, you have four things that you go by all across every aspect of your life. That's that's, that's right. really keeping things simple and keeping things in perspective. I I like that a lot. And I like the fact that you're willing to try different things, not get stuck on one thing. Um, Learn a lot about you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. It's all, you know, it's a mental game. And like, if you got chaos in your life outside of the racetrack, it's going to translate to the racetrack because you're always thinking about it, right? So I don't know. It's, uh, I've done a lot of work on myself this last, and my life, my home life, uh, the last winter. I weeded out a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, man, you just got to stay calm and cool and, and keep going. Roll with the punches. You, you seem like you're you, you're a type of guy that stays pretty even keel. Uh, you, when your win light lit up in the final against Tim Thomas, did you? Did, I'm just curious. Me and Kyle Seipel used to always uh, we were people watchers. Um, did you pump your fist? Did you scream, or did you just say, "I knew that was going to happen"? I did give a fist pump, and I did give a Ric Flair woo. But yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff, Matt. Thanks for coming on Behind the Flings. And uh, we look forward to seeing you down the road. Good luck the rest of the year. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it, man. Electronics, the leader in performance electronics. Racers know and depend on their state-of-the-art systems every day. Perform Air Pro and Perform Air Eclipse are the racing industry standard, high-tech, easy-to-use weather systems. Power Light Lithium Batteries, the super-powerful, lightweight energy source for your machine. And the Data Quest Power Quest, the most innovative data recorders and touchscreen switch panels you can find. Check out AltronicsInc.com for these products and more. Altronics, the choice of champions. Order online and use promo code FLING23 for discount. Welcome to Behind the Flings. I'm here with Andy Schmall, our Mosier Engineering 2023 Spring Fling Million winner. How's it going today, Andy? Good, Peter. How are you doing? Doing good. You know, um, Things are going good, but not not as good as you. You won our biggest spring fling million ever this year. 
makes for a great start to the year, that's for sure. Definitely gives you a little uh, kick kick in the rear to to uh, a little momentum, right? Yep, that's absolutely true. And and gives me actually a lot more opportunity over the summer to try try some other bigger races too. Vegas, you've been killing it the last couple of years. Is there any anything too? I know for myself, I have certain tracks over the years uh, when I was traveling to the National Event Tour that I just did better at, and I couldn't really explain it. It was just you just feel more comfortable, more confident. What's it about Vegas? I don't know. The, uh, the the track there is great. Jeff Foster there does a great job of the track prep. It's 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 always there. Uh, the bread has always been good. Uh, the car is definitely a lot better than I ha- than I am. Uh, and I, I kind of take pride in that because uh, I, I spent a lot of time and a lot of thought working on, hey, what, what can we change? How can we make this a little better? Um, but let's talk about that car. Let's, that thing, um, I watch a lot of cars. I watch a lot of rounds. I have all the data sheets. Man, that thing was deadly, particularly the day of the, uh, the Friday of the main event. The car is uh, it's a tube chassis car. Uh, it was a pro street car built by Gebhardt originally. Uh, Kennedy Race Cars in Colorado uh, did a complete body off makeover of it in 2016, right before I bought it. Um, we've been running a, uh, a short stroke big block combination on our Nova. Just what it came with seems to work okay. Um, so, in an effort to make the same kind of uh, combination, keep the same spare parts, uh, just decided to go try it in the Beretta. And it started out with a 432, uh, made about 660 horse, and I, I ran that for a few years. And then last summer, we uh, got with Mark Kidd, uh, talked about, he, he always wants me to build more power, and I always try and come back and slow it down a little bit, uh, especially for the bottom bulb to kind of keep it in, the, in a competitive driving range. But uh, we built a 478 big block, um, has has good parts in it. Uh, it's got a it's got a glide transmission, and then I uh, run a restrictor plate because out here we can run anywhere from, you know, eight thousand nine thousand feet DA up in Montana to, you know, if you go to Southern California, you're down to four hundred feet. Uh, and so I use the restrictor plate to kind of balance it out and make the torque converter happy, um, and it it seemed to work out. And another thing I think is helpful out here is running methanol, uh, especially with the dry air. I think it, I think it likes it a lot, uh, helps it work well. The restrictor plate's interesting. So you, you basically, you said you even it out. So if you, let's just go from one extreme to the other. If you went from Denver to um, the East Coast sea level or Sonoma for that, for that matter, uh, you just put more restriction on it at the sea level just so it, uh, a, you could hit probably could hit the bottom better, right? It get, keeps your spot similar. Does that have anything to do with it too? Uh, it is a little factor. Uh, I've only been doing this for a year and a half now, so it's been interesting to find as I change the restrictor plate how I have to change the the starting line RPM to compensate for for the car having a little bit more power. Uh, but Racing in Denver, uh, usually I'd run it wide open. I can go probably 605, 606 in the eighth, and then dial it back to a sea level tune up, which I, I usually try and be around the 590 range. Uh, I wanted to try and mess with power and the torque converter to see if it liked going faster, or liked being slower, uh, and trying to keep that happy and see where a good spot was for that. But it seems to really like that that 590 range. It's a good spot to be too, because it, it is, there's a lot of 620 to 650 cars where if you're 590, they're uh, pretty, I'm not going to say an easy target, but they're right there with you and you're controlling the race. So I could, I could see that. Yeah. It makes, it makes the race look a lot, a lot, but a lot easier for you. At the finish line. I've run methanol alcohol my first half of my racing career and then I switched to gas once I got the bigger motors at 12 degree and such um now I have a small block that I'm thinking about going to to uh in the door car thinking about going to methanol what do you what do you like about methanol the most uh I like it really from a scientific standpoint because you you have more oxygen integrated into the fuel right so when that's the case your your air changes shouldn't affect the engine as much. Um, 
because of that, that constant oxygen that you have in the fuel. And so just from that standpoint, uh, I've always liked it. And it's probably, it's the only thing I've ran in the car since 20, you know, over, over 10 years. What do you, what do you follow mostly when you dial in the car? Like, what is it, what is it, uh, what's its pattern? What does it track to? Is it density altitude? Is it vapor pressure, uh, humidity, all of the above? Uh, the biggest thing I follow is water grains, water grains, humidity, and barometric pressure. If I exclusively looked at those, I would, I would be, you know, 80% of the way to a, a solid number with the car. Uh, wind plays a little bit of a factor, but not nearly as much as our, uh, as our Nova. So I looked through some of your rounds. First of all, car was deadly. You were solid. You, you face off against uh, Pollard. You face off against Mike Bedeau, Zach Fulcher, a lot of East Coast racers that you probably haven't raced before. Uh, your, your car was really printing tickets well. Um, any one round, uh, I know as you get to the split, as you get to the final, that changes things a little bit as far as the intensity, but any, any one round that you feel like you might have dodged a bullet? The round of 10. Uh, I got Zach Fulcher that round. Uh, there was one I let go and was like, oh, that was really good. And then because of the whole changing the bump up, bump down situation, uh, thought about it for an extra second, whatever it was, I didn't, I didn't get to the bump up and end up being one. Um, and so that, that I got away with that one, uh, which then got me the buy at five. So it really helped. Good help time to do it. Case. Yeah. And then the other one, I think, was the uh, Mike Bedeau run, where I think we were, we were close up front. Uh, I ended up dropping to one above. He's under a couple thou, uh, getting there just over 10 or something like that. And so that one that one easily could have swung the other way. And that's, that's kind of what I tell my guys at work, because they go, hey, why aren't you, why are you still here? Why aren't you out racing if you, you know, you can win a big check like this? And I'm like, Hey, that, that one round right there was the difference in, you know, a, a $7,500 tab or, you know, a hundred thousand dollar payday. So right. it just, it's a, it's a flip of the coin. And if the thousands are going your way, then it, it turns out well for you. Well, I'm, I'm going to argue that point a little bit because you say flip of the coin, but to run against Mike Bedeau, you were both 016. You obviously could have got there because you were holding a little bit. Um, and at the last minute, you decided to let him take the strike. So I think it was uh, a key moment, uh, a key decision, and a real, real, um, sometimes it takes guts to give the other guy the strike. Um, and, and that was probably a position like you weren't really sure. And the flip of the coin wasn't luck. The flip of the coin was you making the right choice there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, it's making the right decisions and putting yourself in a spot. Uh, where you're more likely to be successful. I like that. I, I try not. I try not to make the big mistakes. The uh, you know the dropping five above uh, type deals where you, you get caught up in the track position with the other person. I try to kind of stick with the game plan and land it. You know, mid dead on if I can get there. Uh, and try not to worry as much about the other guy. So we we joke with my brother because my brother is he's 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 a better finish line driver than I am. Uh, and the way he'll lose races is he'll be a couple of thou behind and five thou, uh, he'll be a couple of thou behind and five hunt over, you know, and I'm kind of the opposite where I'll be, I'll get there 40 and be a couple of thou under just not, not seeing it well, but killing what I think I need to kill. Uh, so we joke about that. Um, let's fast forward to the, to the final. So you're running Kyle Coltrera, one of the East coast hitters that has been on a tear the last couple of years. He's in, he's in a dragster. You change anything in your game plan? I, I know Kyle's a great driver, uh, and so I, I I wanted to to change the the scene at the finish line a little bit, and so putting the eighty eight on there, I figured uh, everything's good. Uh, I can spray it just before the first cone. I should pick up five thousand to one hundred somewhere in there, and uh, hope that it works. And in that case, I ended up you know, a little behind at the tree. Um, he was killing a little bit and ended up landing at dead four uh, on the spray. And so. And you got uh, there eight, eight thou, right? If I remember yep. correctly. 
And yeah. I did the math. You can tell me, you know, your car better than me, but it looked like it looked like if you didn't spray, it was going to be really tight, really yep. tight. Right? Like yep. it went out either way. Yeah, that was that eight was a, about what I think I picked up. That That's what so, I saw. Yeah. Hard to but say again, either way. Just like the round against the that takes a lot of guts to to uh, to change your strategy going into the final. But it's it was a smart move. You're going 80. You're going high 88 low to mid 89. And, um, you know, if you put an 89 on it, you might have a tendency to to uh, go down there and get kill too much, go one, two over. And, and you uh, you did, you opted to go with the 88 and uh, and use little nitrous if need be. That's I love the guts. I love the aggression. I just love the way you you piece it all together and you're not afraid to to take chances. The whole scenario and how it worked out and how good of a driver Kyle is. I uh, knew that, hey, I, I, it felt like I had to do something right. And then the last thing was uh, uh, take a quote from Kyle Seipel, right? Uh, Got to let it let it hang out and see what happens, you know, in a yeah. better story. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I could relate to that that way of thinking. Um, you know, sometimes you don't, you, you have all the numbers in your head and then you come up with the strategy at the last minute uh, based on the circumstances. Um, Speaking of our, our buddy Kyle Seipel, I know he was shining down and smiling. He always was a big fan of you. Um, you're a humble guy. You're a family man. It's hard not to root for you. The you pick up the biggest payday in Fling Million history. Then you pick up the five thousand dollar bonus from from Kyle Seipel. Then you're in the winner's circle with your family. Um, then the limo picks you up. Tell us about that whole uh, that whole experience after you won. Yeah, coming back, the winter circle celebration, the little pictures they do on the track right after. You got the limo there. Uh, it all it all just kind of to, runs together. Uh, my wife went and got my two year old up, who was you know who went to bed a little earlier. Um, the four year old was there. She'd been up playing all night with the uh, friends at the track, covered in dirt, whatever. She she was having a good time. Uh, and then uh, we also have a dog at the racetrack. And so going to the hotel at uh, one in the morning with two kids and a dog wasn't wasn't going to work out well for us. And so talked to limo driver. He was a good sport. Uh, my four year old, I was hungry. I'm sure my four year old was too, and she wanted to ride in the limo. So we talked him into taking us to McDonald's. So <laughs> we uh, drove the limo over to McDonald's, had him roll through the drive through, ordered a bunch of cheeseburgers. Uh, we even got the limo driver one. We hooked him up because. Uh, we had, we had to do some convincing to get him to uh, drive the limo through the drive through. He, was, he, did, he didn't really want to do that at first, but uh, he made it without hitting the curbs too, which was good. Um, so we I did remember that. You, sending, you sending me a text the next day. Um, that's pretty cool. And, and that just goes with your personality. I mean, you're a humble guy. You're a family man. You just won <laughs> the Spring Fling Million and you're, going, you're, you're eating McDonald's cheeseburger. Coltrara does love his burnouts, doesn't he? He does love his burnouts. It, it occurs to me, if Coltrara is going to do a burnout to the eighth mile, do we really need to send a tractor down in front of him? I mean, he's doing his own, he's doing his own broom and drag out there. What the heck? If Pennington wins, he's got two entries in the final three. If Coltrera wins, there's a distinct possibility he'll have to run peeps again later on tonight. Of course, Mr. York doesn't think so, but we'll find out. Both of them easing in. Countdown's going to come down in the right lane first. They're in. They're set. They're both away on the green. Wow, listen to the whomp and coming early. Kyle Coltrera, 003, can't get there.
Pennington goes 0-13, dead one, taken two thou, and Pennington is in the final and in the semifinal. Got the bye run at three. He could potentially race himself in the final round. And if York wants to win the 30 grand, gonna have to beat Pennington twice. All right, here we are at the 2023 Strange Spring Fling presented by Optima Batteries. We're in the Galat Tower Suite. I'm sitting here with J.J. Pennington, and uh, we're going to talk about the history of how he became part of our staff. 